What is going on, you guys? Welcome back to Down to the Wire. I'm your host, Brian Costa, and we have a great show in store for you guys today. We're going to be reviewing all the latest with the MLB ending their lockout, as well as the latest across the NFL. There have been some crazy moves over in the trade market there uh, very recently, including today, uh, just recently, uh, Amari Cooper now going to the Cleveland Browns. We'll be covering that along with Khalil Mack to the L.A. Chargers and so much more. Uh, you know, it's going to be a great show in store for you today. Uh, we're, but however, we're going to start things off, uh, kind of reiterating, reiterating back to my last episode where we talked about the Bryant university men's basketball game and some of the, uh, extracurricular activities that went on there. Uh, before we do that though, I want to welcome on a guest to, to the show today. Uh, you've seen, you've seen him on this show many times before he is the host of the fumble Ruski podcast, and he is a good friend of mine. So without any further ado, please welcome back to the show, Mr. Adam, right? Adam. How you doing today, man? I'm doing great. Thanks for that ex- introduction. That was a great, uh, that was a great little way to uh, introduce me, reintroduce me since I've been on far too many times. Yeah, it's, it, I'm kind of getting sick of on this program at this point, Adam. All it's, right, uh, I'll just go f myself. Yeah, you, you honestly should. I mean, I don't know why I keep inviting you on this thing, but hey, I'm in your house. Yeah, I yeah, and I, I've I, met I, your family. Yeah, we should, uh, we should, we should stop that while we're ahead. But listen. Uh, I'm glad to have you back on. I, I'm 12 years ahead. <laughs> but listen, I'm glad to have you back on the show. Uh, obviously, our spring breaks kind of converge. You're heading back to school. I am now just getting off of school. So uh, while, you, while you have to go back to the classroom, I'm going to be enjoying not the sunshine of, uh, you know, Florida or anything like that. I'll be enjoying uh, just kind of the, the amazingness that happens to be in Sutton, Massachusetts. But hey, be enjoying school books. Yeah. Yeah. Just yeah. Do you, I hope you have a fun time with that, buddy. But uh, I appreciate it. I will. <laughs> listen, it's going to be listen. It's going to be a great time no matter what. Uh, but I am glad to have you on the show regardless. You know, all jokes aside. And I do want to cover these sports topics topics with you today. So obviously I wanted to get in touch with uh, I wanted to go back and talk about the Bryant men's basketball game. Obviously, I did an entire episode on this show. I went very in depth. If you didn't check out that episode, make sure you go check it out after you watch this one. But in case you did miss it, the Bryant University men's basketball team ended up winning the NAC championship game and is advancing to March Madness for the first time in school history. They're going to find out who they're playing next or, or the, on Selection Sunday. So that's going to be a very interesting thing to see as well. But uh, obviously, the game, unfortunately, for the most part, got overshadowed by a fight that broke out in the fans in, in the student section during the game. And there's now some late, there's now some new developments going on with that, which I wanted to cover. Obviously I covered some things going on with some going, I covered, uh, you know, the news that I had at the time going on with the fight in the student section. Uh, I've just shown Adam, you know, just before starting this show, some, some footage of the fight in the student section, uh, Adam, I know you were listening to this, uh, through some Boston sports talk radio and just in general, uh, what, what are your overall first thoughts on just seeing this fight go down? Well, certainly sort of one of those two sides to every story type of things. Yeah, because, you know, Wag- Wagner is, has been turning around and a lot of people have who are sort of third party have been turning around and saying Bryant students are idiots. The players are, are jackasses. And like it's it seems like there. And then you hear from the Bryant students. They're all they're all you know, it's very objectively saying, yeah, they all like, you know, Wagner sort of uh, Wagner sort of reciprocated on it and no, or they started it and nobody's really defending us. Yeah. So a lot, not, not really anyone is defending Bryant at this point in time. It's been, it's been very anti Bryant and people are like almost kind of pro Wagner, which I'm surprised at. And uh, obviously I, as a Bryant student, I'm not condoning what went down in the fan section. I'm not, you know, in support of people, you know, pouring drinks on each other, throwing punches and whatnot. I'm not a fan of that whatsoever. I, think that's a very easy thing to come out and say that's shouldn't be a controversial statement here on down to the wire but listen uh, I wasn't a fan of what went down in the stands but I can also understand the fact that we weren't the only people that contributed to it now it would have also helped had wet you know I don't think this fight would have broken out uh, if Wagner if the Wagner basketball team hadn't shown up and forgot that they had to play and forgot that they had to play a basketball game on Tuesday that would have probably prevented this fight as well because you know, again, the main part of this thing is that Wagner got absolutely rocked in this basketball game. Like they ended up losing by like 37 points at, at the end. I mean, it was ugly. If, if you saw this game, Peter Kiss, who obviously, if you don't watch Bryant basketball, is the kind of the star of the show there. He leads the nation in scoring currently going into the March Madness tournament. He absolutely just torched them for 34 points. He was 
just unstoppable in this game. I mean, and it also probably didn't help the fact that he was doing constant, uh, you know, showboating actions after pretty much every single basket, probably fired up the uh, both fan sections in a different way. But uh, obviously, very, very passionate response that broke out uh, on both sides. And uh, it's, you know, the latest developments with it are the fact that, you know, the uh, Wagner University has since responded to this uh, whole situation. They basically come out and, you know, essentially said that they have that this has nothing to do with them. I have a statement from Wagner. I'm going to have to pull it up here really quickly on my computer. But basically, yeah, well, it's unfortunately I'm having some technical difficulties, but here we go. So Wagner College ends up putting out a statement from their president and and yeah, it's their president's name is uh, Angelo Ar- 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 Aramino or, or Ar- Aramio. I'm sorry, I can't pronounce the name, but it, it, when it comes to this, you know, their statement, I'm not really worried about that because Wagner comes out in their response to the entire fight where you saw students from both sides kind of going at each other. Their response is that. Uh, at least a segment from it is that no Wagner student was directly involved in the incident, but we decided to remove our, but we decided to remove ourselves from the increasingly hostile and unmanageable environment. You which, gotta be kidding. Yeah. So that's what they said. And I'm just like, all right, even when Ross Cattell, who's Brian's president reached out and, you know, in my opinion, I don't think he, you know, had that strong of a statement towards us. It was more kind of a slap on the wrist thing of like, Hey, we shouldn't do that. But the general theme of it was basically that, Hey, We had some students that acted out, but it doesn't represent the broader community. That's all I think Wagner needed to say here. And it would have been like, okay, that, that, that's, that could have been your presidential statement. They pointed the finger. Yeah. But the fact, yeah, exactly. The fact that they had the gall to say that there was not a single Wagner student involved in this conflict. We have it on video. One guy punching a dude in the face. Oh, we have it on video. All right. You know, I work in, uh, I, I work at the school and, you know, I work, you know, in the athletic communications department at Bryant and this entire week, typically, uh, what straight up socked him. Oh no. Yeah. So, you know, this, this kid got clocked. If you missed it, like the kid in the USA, jersey larry bird jersey got his lights knocked out so it it was ugly and i find it funny that they're basically saying oh no one was involved in this conflict because i work in athletic communications at bright university and when what you do with that is obviously they're kind of the group that puts together like the highlight videos and coordinates all the social media for these athletic websites and they kind of do that for all the teams like if there's a basketball hype video brian athletics is usually behind it so instead of making hype videos this week we were taking all the footage from our game from the fight and turning it over to the NEC for a proper investigation. So that's what our week was spent doing. And you know how you can, you know how on ESPN, you can kind of do like the spotlight treatment where you zoom in on someone. We're doing that on the Wagner fans, like throwing stuff. And I can tell you, there's at least over 10 of you doing that. So uh, if, if Wagner really wants to come out and, and say, we have no response and say, we had no people involved with that fine. But when the formal investigation comes out, your ass is going to be screwed, dude. You're, you're done. Just not a single. Wasn't there Wagner <laughs> players who were throwing throwing chairs in the stands? Will Martinez, who's a Wagner player, almost went in the stands. He almost not, it, it, not al- a single almost Wagner student was involved. You yeah. hear that? That's I not mean, a single student. I mean, do you want to hear a bigger crock of shit? I'm sorry. Like that is the that is the biggest lie I think I've ever heard. And listen, Wagner. Again, if you had actually come out there and played a legitimate basketball game, I'd feel I I'd, I'd be like, okay, whatever. But the fact that you actually you actually got dogged out there by us and and then proceeded to come at us, I, it, it's embarrassing. And again, while I'm not defending any of the Bryant students in the video of the in the video from ESPN of the fight, you can see uh, you can see them push up on our fan section as they're trying to advance to throw punches. Again, no, I'm not saying Bryant students are innocent here. They're not. There is a group of them that were not innocent. But also, 80 percent of the Bryant fan section sat down once once we realized what was going on. Originally, in my mind, I thought the I thought the Wagner men's basketball team was having like an internal fight with each other. And it looked like they were getting separated for that. Then I realized the fans are trying to go into the stands and it turned into an absolute melee up there. And can I add on, Brian? Yeah, I was. And I I called you as soon as I saw this (laughs) on sports talk radio on Zolak and Bertrand. Yeah. So it's not only just. Um, it's not only just, you know, that one side that's defending themselves, yeah. that it's the, it's the third parties as well, mm-hmm. who don't go to Bryant, but don't go to Wagner either, who are just hearing about this story. So on Zolak and Bertrand, they were talking about the students. They were calling the players idiots. They were calling Peter, uh, Peter kiss and, and 
an asshole yeah a jackass well i was talking about how i mean he does celebrate every play but so, he does that all the time yeah well the thing behind peter kiss uh and th that's kind of a general consensus around the country outside of smithville rhode island now I, I, I've, I've had a chance to talk with people close to Peter Kiss. I know he does incredible work with uh, Special Olympics. I know he's very involved with things like that, but he does like to showboat. He does like to, uh, you know, really show off his personality. It's kind of who he is, but that also kind of drives him uh, to be the kind of player that he is. It's something that's always been a part of him where uh, if the gym is, if no one's really making noise in the gym, he doesn't perform as well. When people are either cheering or booing for him, that's when he goes off. And I don't know, just again, it was the fact that Wagner came out and said that none of our people were responsible, that that, that was the most ludicrous response that you could have had. At least just say, hey, none of us are perfect here. We're going to try to move on from the situation, be better as a result of it. That's all you need to say, Wagner. That's all you need to say, freaking uh, Angelo. That's all you need to say. It, it wasn't that difficult. Wagner's president's a clown. <laughs> yeah, I know. I don't, I don't even know what this guy looks like, but I can already tell he probably looked good in face paint. I, that, that's the only thing I'm saying right now. But he's listen, probably in the stands, he's oh, probably. I mean, I mean, I, I wouldn't surprise me if he was in the stands again. Uh, after the game, the entire Wagner student section needed to get removed. Bryant's didn't, which you, you could make the case that they should have been removed. But at the same time, which student section needed to get taken out of the game? <laughs> I mean, you're yeah, you're it. You can't say that not a single uh, Wagner student was involved. If you if the if they had to remove your 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 fan base from the stand. Yeah. I mean, and, and not only were they not only were, were they aggressive towards Bryant, I heard they were just like self-destructive. Uh, I, 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 had a, I had a source tell me that uh, they ended up going up into their pep band and just broke all their broke all their pep bands instruments. I heard like one of them like threw a trumpet or something, maybe. And yeah. just like, and they just broke their own band's instruments. I'm just like and I honestly feel I honestly got I feel bad for the pep band because. Like, like but these remember, guys. Brian, not a single Wagner <laughs> fan was involved. Yeah, exactly. So, but, but meanwhile, they're, they're willing to go up and break a tuba just for the sake of it. And I, I got honest to God, I feel bad for those pep band kids. Cause like, like what did they do to deserve this? Like they literally like these kids go to this school on scholarship to play in to play in the band. They have to go to these events that maybe they want to be at this game, but regardless of it, even if they didn't, they have to be there. So like when when you're when you're break when you're a fan base and you're breaking their own instruments, I'm like, what are you doing? <laughs> I mean, it, it's so ludicrous. And they remove themselves from the situation. Yeah, no, well, they, yeah, forcibly by the way of the Rhode Island Police Department. In case you missed it, the entire state of Rhode Island was on was on Bryant University's campus. There was about 30 cop cars in the parking lot as I was leaving the place. It it literally looked like the president was there. It it. It, it looked like there like there was like secret service or something going on. And and not only did the Wagner people, uh, you know, not only did they make a did they make a scene in the gym? I'd heard rumors afterwards that they had like that they were like going after people like outside the stadium. And I'm like, what are you doing? I mean, I mean, it, I mean, obviously the entire situation was was a disaster from start to finish. You know, whether that was placing them next to each other, like the two fan bases, or even just dividing them by a tiny little string of rope up the side, that was the most comical part of all. Uh, you know, the other big, the other funny part of this whole thing, too, is that now after the whole uh, situation is cleared, the, uh, you know, the Bryant, Bryant University's president ended up announcing uh, like 48 hours later that we're going to have a, a new stadium built at Bryant University with about with like, you know, 2000 more seats. So uh, it it just took a uh, it just took us getting on Sports Center with a legendary fight to get a new stadium reinforcements <laughs> yeah pretty reinforcements. much uh steve what, what are you saying how was how was there no wagner students involved there there were no the, there would be no fight wasn't a brawl between the bryant students and was a brawl between the wagner and bryant students yeah I, it, it was a brawl between both of them i think that you know both parties are at fault here it was no you know it was no one side you know over the other i think that both parties could have you know this could have been prevented but again it's the fact that wagner said that no one was involved that was the funniest thing to me but Obviously, uh, hopefully Bryant can move on from this, go into the tournament strong and just have a great run there. Uh, I mean, they're most likely going to be 15, 16 seed, maybe even a play in. So they're there's going to have they're going to have to uh, they're going to have to battle these next couple of days, but hopefully they can do it. Uh, you know, that kind of concludes, though, what we have in this uh, revisiting of the Bryant uh, basketball game. Just wanted to touch on that because I thought that statement from Wagner was absolute bullshit. So I, I did want to move on from that. Yeah. Well, you you mentioned Peter Peter Kiss. He does build off that energy. Yes. So maybe, you know, this this does put more of a target on Bryant's back. This does elevate. 
Peter Kiss's play and maybe they go further into the tournament than expected. I mean, you'd like to think so, because if you know Peter Kiss, like he again, he thrives off this kind of stuff. If, if any people hating on him, he look, he's the type of person to like pin those comments up against a wall and be like, yes, I love that. Bolton and, material. Oh, it, it's all Bolton material to him and to Coach Grasso, who uh, has done a fantastic job with this Bryant basketball team. So obviously credit to him, credit to credit to Kiss, credit to Coach Grasso, uh, Charles Pride, all the members of the team that are doing a great job there. Uh, but I think it is time to move on to our next segment, which is uh, in the MLB. Obviously, uh, there wasn't a ton of MLB news going on these past couple months because we because the MLB decided to have a full on lockout and, you know, screw the fans out of some baseball. So there was, uh, you know, for about three, for, I think it was 99 total days. They there was no, uh, you know, there was no formal CBA. And it looks like games are going to get canceled between the uh, MLB, you know, across the 160 game. 162 game season uh that was at least what we were told as of a week ago and it looked like more series were going to get canceled as a result we need we, we had no idea when the season was going to start but uh seemingly at the 11th hour all of the all of the things that we were told about games getting canceled was a complete and total lie and we are actually going to have a baseball season this year and not just that we're going to get a full season we're going to get a whole full 162 game season the players and owners have finally come to an agreement and I'm honestly psyched about it. I mean, Adam, I know you're a big baseball fan yourself. How are you feeling about this? So I, I really thought, and a lot of other people thought this was going to be something that would just really scar yeah. the game and sort of alienate a lot of fans for years to come. But the fact that they're, that this came, they came out of this base practically on skate. Yeah. No well, full 162 game season. This came at a great time because in recent years, we've had the Astros and their cheating scandal. Yes. We've had spider tech. We've had, you know, the how bad the NFL, the sorry, the MLB has been at marketing their at marketing their players. It's atrocious. The yeah. pace of play issues, all of that, and for this on top of it, it was really not good. And then the, the pandemic you add, where they weren't able to agree on how long the season was going to be, and then you you're able to find to fight through this and get a season. This is huge. For yeah. Them. And again, having a full season is huge. And I know a lot of people, a lot of people will come out and say 162 games is so much, and you can make the case for them to cut that down in the future, but 162 games is what the season is. And, and it's built like that because baseball is a marathon. It's kind of just a very slow paced, you know, national pastime. And the fact that, you know, it, again, maybe you could have gone down to 156, which is what they used to have back in the day. It used to actually be 156 games, but I'm glad that they're actually, you know, trying to stay with the precedent this year instead of just cutting it down, saying that we lost it because of it. And now we're going to have to, you know, go as a result of that. I'm glad that we are actually going to have those games this year. So that is something I'm very glad about as well. Uh, but there's also going to be some new rule changes coming with the MLB this season. So uh, one of those rule changes is that we're going to have a universal DH in both leagues. Uh, so, you know, it, this was tested out in 2020 in the National League where, uh, you know, the shortened Mickey Mouse 60 game season where they put, uh, you know, they put a DH in the National League just trying to, you know, move things along. And, you know, it, it had its ups and downs, but for the most part, it was fairly successful. And in 2021, they decided to get rid of it when they went back to a full season. But now in 2022, we have a we have a National League uh, DH as well, Universal DH. And uh, I, I don't know, I, I've I've had my app. I've been very apprehensive about this. Adam, what are your thoughts on the Universal DH? I'm not as upset about it as most other as most other people. Yeah, because, you know, I mean, a pitcher. I mean, it's it's great to see pitchers rake, but most of the time <laughs> they're an automatic out. Sorry, yeah. pitchers. I love watching you guys bat. I love watching you guys go yard. And it's so hype when it happens. But you we, number one, we don't want you to get hurt. because yeah. You're known for your pitching, not for your batting. <laughs> And number two, it's kind of an automatic out. So it kind of it weakens the those National League teams. And once you get over to the World Series, you need to find a DH who's never played, who's never been a DH before. And you've never had a player who's been specifically ha uh, there for that reason. So you have to get somebody off the bench to play DH. Yeah. Uh, obviously, there's a lot of challenges that go into it. And, uh, you know, you can make the other case of it, too, to where you take an American League team and you put them in the National League and you have to have that DH play the field, like when J.D. Martinez was playing right field in the 2018 World Series or when David Ortiz was playing first base in, you know, the three World Series that he that he came up with, bought, that he came up with in Boston. Obviously, he had to play uh, first base against St. Louis, Colorado, and then back in St. Louis again. So uh, that was something that he had to do yeah. when he was there. Did we get a comment in the in the section here? Yeah, that was more about kind of the Wagner fight, uh, the from, Wagner from, fight. from Steve. I'll, I'll, I'll cover that. I'll go back on that at the end of the episode. But, uh, you know, it it had to, with with the DH, though, 
I liked the difference that it provided. And, you know, I, I've made this case on the show many times before. A simplified version of it is that the American and National League used to be two separate leagues. And, uh, you know, th this was like way back when. And there, there were like different baseballs used, different umpires. The strike zone was different. And, you know, when these two teams would play each other in the World Series, it really was seeing who is the best of these two leagues. I, I liked having the DH in one league because it kind of harkened back to that original uh, philosophy of baseball. Now, really, the in my opinion, now the AL and NL are essentially useless. Like, you're not really gaining or losing anything by going to one league. I mean, when the Brewers went to the NL, they had to give up their DH and had to have a pitcher bat. Uh, uh, and then vice versa, when the Astros came to the American League, they gained a DH. So uh, there's really no there's I, I think you could see some uh, conferences flip around or some, uh, you know, standings and divisions flip around within within the next couple of years. And it's really not going to have any effects. And then. I don't know. I, I've never really been a big fan of it. I, I liked having the DH in the American League because that made the American League more offensive based while the National League was more defensive based. But I understand the fact that that maybe doesn't sell as many tickets and doesn't get those and doesn't get the ratings which MLB is looking for. So I'm disappointed in it. But I, again, I'm looking forward to baseball moving forward into this season. Uh, but some of the rule changes that I'm really not a big fan of, though, are. Shift. Yeah. So they're so they're uh, this isn't happening this year, but they're basically trying to outlaw the shift in, in the MLB. And this thing to me is completely stupid. I mean, I, I don't know, uh, you know, obviously righty hitter talking right here. So maybe there's a little bit of bias uh, involved. But, you know, a, as a righty hitter, uh, I mean, I, I, you know, I'm, I'm not I, I'm not going to speak on it from my personal experience with the shift, but. Uh, you know, obviously the shift's been around in baseball for many different years. Uh, I've had, I've had this guy in the show before he does TikTok content, uh, Joel Flam, AKA Hey Kami. Uh, he's talked about the shift harking back to, uh, the Williams shift, which many people think is reference to Ted Williams, but is actually a reference to a guy named Cy Williams, who was like a power hitter back in the day. And they shifted against him to, you know, try to keep, uh, try to keep the ball out of the yard. And, you know, even when they were shifting against Ted Williams, Ted Williams hit 400. I mean, the, like these great hitters that had to battle against the shift had still good batting average. Freddie Freeman, who's a, le who's a great lefty hitter, still hits 300 even when dealing with the shift. But it, it's not those guys that are really complaining about it. The guys that are complaining about it are like are guys like freaking Joey Gallo, who bat, who bat below 100, still hit, somehow managed to hit uh, 30 bombs, but have only had 100 hits once in a season. And for me, th that's where I kind of have to draw the line. I'm like, okay. I, if you were a good player and you and you thought you were kind of getting screwed out of it and, you know, you know, here and there, I could understand it. But when Joey Gallo is basically a walking strikeout like a third of the time, I can't really I, I can't really have any sympathy for a guy like that. He you know, he's a he's a three true outcome player and he's trying to he's trying to change the game. Yeah, it, it's one of those things where it just feels like so you're not good enough to hit it on all sides yeah. of the field. So it's like, let's just go after the rules and just let's try to change it so that you can become a better player. Yeah. Like if you want, if you want to beat the shift, then beat the shift. Yeah. Don't do, don't go after the rules and just say, well, I don't really, like, I don't, I don't really like when the shortstop is over towards the second base side or, you know, just hit it to that other side with that shift. You're going to get some big gaps of space. So try and fi fix your game. Yeah. Don't go after it. Like, it's just, it's just lazy. And I, and I know what people have been saying is, is essentially, well, you, you don't, you, you don't have to stand in there facing a hundred mile an hour fastball, but again, I'm not an MLB player. I'm, I don't have, I, you know, MLB players statistically have better vision than the average, than the average like citizen, like in, or just any person in the world. They have, they have better vision than most of us. So they have the ability to probably break down that pitch and, you know, and do more with it than, you know, the average person would. I'm not saying that it, I'm not saying it's a fair thing to do, but you have that opportunity available to you. And again, you know, at, at the end of the day, you could just bunt it. And I, I know, I know that's a very old fashioned approach and, you know, bunting isn't sexy and whatnot, but hell, if you, if, if, if they shift on you five times in a game and you were willing to bunt it five times and get impossible, even get on like three of those five, they're, 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 eventually teams are going to say, screw, we can't shift on this guy anymore. It's, it's going to be like, he, he's just willing to drop it down. Like, like, like just if, even if you were to factor that into your game, it would be enough to change the dynamic. Yeah, it's a very it's just a very typical argument just yeah. to try and go after and say, well, you don't you don't play baseball. So yeah. You can't have your opinion. You can have an opinion. I'm just like, sure, I like, can. Like, why, like, why are you getting so defensive like that? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I mean, from from 2013, the shifts across baseball have gone up uh, by like three times uh, by like nine times. There have been nine times as many shifts, which obviously is something that uh, is kind of a product of the analytic age and something that, you know, a lot of guys are taking into account. But at the same time, I, I, I don't think they should be getting rid of the shift. It's something that I think is something 
it's still a useful tool across the MLB. It, it, and I think that I, I think that for teams they should they should still be allowed to use it. They're still going to be be allowed to use it in 2022, but I guess we will see some rules coming in uh, 2023 and beyond. So I don't know. Hopefully there hopefully maybe something happens happens with that. But a pretty popular conversation that's come up is how valuable are lefty hitters going to be as a result of the shift, and uh, their value is going to skyrocket if that's the case. Because again, if a guy like Freddie Freeman is hitting 300 with the shift, if you take that guy away, he's going to be he's going to be insane he might he might you know be at ted williams level i never thought about it that way but that does make a big difference between the between the difference between left-handed hitters and right-handed hitters is going to be huge oh yeah and if you're a switch hitter too imagine that yeah you're gonna you, that, that'll increase value by a ton so i mean maybe a guy like freddie freeman this year like if he was to go to like the dodgers which there have been talks about him going there uh you know if if you know, he could possibly he could possibly get a huge contract uh, under the assumption that, hey, the shift isn't going to the shift isn't going to be there anymore. You can uh, and he's just going to be able to just be able to laser balls into the outfield now that that, that could be something that's uh, going to real that's that could be something that could happen very soon. Yeah, I mean, you're going to you're now that the shift is gone, defenses can't really adjust to any sort of yeah. any, you know, players who, who really pull it all the time or they'll all, all, always go opposite field mm -hmm. so you're going to see issues like that and player and defense there's there's nothing they can do about it yeah there so really is there really isn't anything more offense because of this yeah no I, oh you're gonna see more offense because of it 100 percent, you're gonna see more offense i mean if you're taking away a defensive strategy and making it illegal they're you're doing it in the in the hopes to see more offense that's why you're doing it like yeah. th that, that is the reason why you're doing it. Uh, you know, uh, before we do move on, uh, a final rule change, which I've been hearing about, uh, you know, we, we, we've talked about the pitch clock on this show before, and I have my personal opinions about that. If they were to implement that, we can talk about that. Uh, but something else that they're thinking about implementing is uh, larger bases to uh, prevent to pre prevent pe to prevent knee injuries uh, when guys are running down the line. You're splitting hairs at this point. <laughs> it, you really are. And I, I for, for me, I'm, for me, I'm just like, a bigger base isn't going to be what prevents a knee injury. You need a softer base if you're going to prevent a knee injury. Because listen, the, uh, I, I don't, I actually don't understand this. The bases, in, the bases in the major leagues are like very like hard and like they're not, they don't really have a lot of give to them. But you think back to like the bases you play on in little league, they have a ton of give. Like I mean, you know, they, you know, they, they're basically like pillows. Yeah, bases come off the come off their mark all the time when you slide. You and I have played baseball most of our lives. When when you slide in. Uh, to second base, stealing a base or, or hitting a double, then it's coming off most of the time. So yeah. I don't understand how that's going to make any sort of difference. Yeah. So, I mean, in my opinion, you need, you need a softer base. Having a bigger one really isn't going to make too much of a difference. I mean, I, I don't really see the benefit in that. I, again, with preventing knee injuries, I just don't see that being a thing because yeah, you, if you have a, if you have a tile that you could like slip on, just making it a bigger tile, isn't going to like help you need to have more give to it because i mean even looking back in the day at like old school baseball they essentially just had pillowcases tied down to the ground that's what guys were running across it was just like these belted down pillowcases so if you want to prevent knee injuries have something like that to where there's not to where it's going to have more give and you know brace the knee a little bit better that that's something i would say there but obviously there's going to be some big moves that happen across the mlb i'm excited for whatever those do look like but Adam, obviously, we're now going to move into a part of the show, which is kind of your forte. Obviously, I mentioned before you came on the show, uh, you're the host of the Fumble Rooski football podcast. So uh, very happy to have you on the show to talk about some football now as we transition into Absolutely. our NFL segment. Uh, as we do that, uh, you know, obviously, there was some big NFL news today. Uh, I do want to cover that. However, I did just see a quick comment in here from the walk off podcast, and he said, uh, I think I think bigger bases would have left for more room uh, defenders to step on the base. Yeah, I mean, yeah, that, that is a pretty that is a pretty, uh, you know, good argument there. I think that is a, I think it could avoid more slide to avoid uh, issues. But I it, you, again, you could make them bigger and softer to, again, avoid these knee injuries, which is something I think that could be beneficial. So if you, you, if you want to make them bigger, sure. But I think it, it would also help to make them softer. Well, you know, there'd be another another way to solve it is make the because make the base closer to the ground like less tall if that makes any sense because mm. you know catching you know catching the edge of it with your let's say your the side of your foot and it makes your whole knee turn yeah what if it's like more flat 
Yeah, you do have a good point about that. And then uh, the walk off just said again that it's that again it's more for avoiding player collisions, which I can I can see that. So uh, I I again I I don't know I don't really see. I mean they're not making the bases that much bigger though. So that that is the thing. So they're not making the bases like a ton more bigger. They're they're significantly larger, but at the end of the day, it's not really going to be uh, the biggest. I I don't. I, I I really don't know where it's going to be the fact to where you're going to avoid player collisions. I think that if something's if something was going to happen previously, it's still going to go down. But at the end of the day, uh, who knows? So back to the NFL segment, which I wanted to get into. Uh, obviously, there have been some big moves across the NFL today. Uh, you know, the biggest one that obviously just went down was that Amari Cooper has been traded from the Dallas Cowboys to the Cleveland Browns uh, for a fit for a 2022 fifth round draft pick and a sixth round draft pick. The Browns also acquire a sixth as well. Uh, obviously, big move for the big move for the Browns, big move for the Cowboys to uh, get Amari Cooper's contract off their books. Uh, they obviously were having some big uh, financial issues there. So, Adam, what are your thoughts on Amari going to Cleveland? So obviously, it sucks that they don't they can't get any more than a fifth round pick and ba- essentially trading up in the sixth round mm-hmm. for Amari Cooper. But they are lucky they got anything. Yeah, and I, I'm upset that the market is what it is for Amari Cooper. That they're that teams are that uh, are that hesitant to take on that contract that they won't that they won't take on you know the talent of Amari Cooper. But at the same time, uh, the the great thing that Dallas was able to do was they were able to get his contract off the books and clear cap space because they have so many free agents on the defensive and offensive side of the ball who they need to keep, and they're you know they're looking to keep. They're like looking to get Michael Gallup back, Cedric Wilson, uh, Dalton Schultz. They're trying to, they're working to afford the franchise tag that they, that they assigned him. They also need Randy Gregory and Leighton Vander Esch is also a free agent are also free agents. So all these players they need to sign, they need to, they need to, to be able to get those. And if they're going to be able to, if they want to improve the Dallas Cowboys, because obviously their base best is that they can stay the same. Uh, with M- Amari Cooper gone, if they're going to improve, they need to look towards the draft. And this is going to be a big draft for them. Look for something on the defensive side of the ball to sort of make them more balanced. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't really know if you need to go out and get another receiver because I do like the way that Gallup has uh, progressed for them. So uh, if you were to go out and into the draft, though, this is going to be a very good receiver draft. I know uh, John Michi out of Alabama has drawn a lot of names. I know there's some other receivers as well that are, uh, kind of getting third that are kind of putting their names out there. But uh, I, again, I, it is a, it is a very difficult uh, thing to understand what is going on with this Amari Cooper deal. Obviously uh, you, you know, you know, the fact that you were able to only get that it only cost a fifth and a six for this guy is pretty crazy, especially, especially because he's going to be under contract uh, until for the next two years, he's going to be under contract actually for, uh, for tw- he's going to be under contract for 20 till 2024. So he's going to be uh, available for, for a lot, for a while, but that contract will take him till he's 30. So there is that factor as well. One other thing to look at with the Amari Cooper trade is that they're already, the Browns are already talking to Cooper about reworking his deal so that it's less so that it's less of a cap hit and the thing with that is that they are already they're not over the cap right now yeah so they're not they're only a few mil above the cap uh, below the cap but the pro the the thing with this is the fact that they are looking to rework the deal to get more cap space tells me that they might be looking to do something else now they don't have really any holes anywhere else on this team, uh, uh, besides quarterback, <laughs> which is potentially is Baker Mayfield on his way out the door, and could they be looking to make a deal, uh, to make a trade for uh, Deshaun Watson, who just got back, got onto the market? Yeah, obviously Deshaun Watson was just uh, put in, you know, uh, just was cleared of all his charges. Uh, he will not be formally charged in any of this, so uh, that he's obviously. Uh, you know, in terms of real quarterbacks available, he's kind of like the last star guy that you'd expect to be on the move this offseason. So uh, if, if you know, the, if the Browns are in the market for a quarterback, Deshaun is probably that guy. Uh, it's going to be difficult to see, though, whether if he is to get traded within the AFC. That's the only uh, that's the only hurdle I could see with that. Uh, it, it would and it would be him getting traded in the AFC, uh, you know, because, again, a lot of these guys, uh, you know, w- one of the trades we'll talk about in a second, Russell Wilson was NFC to AFC and it, it's being done like that. I know that they're going to face each other this year, but 
Uh, it, I feel like it's more kind of that in that area. Uh, you, uh, and just to add on, just to respond to that, you also wonder because there's other there's other teams in the AFC who are still in the running for a quarterback. Yeah. One, namely, being the Pittsburgh Steelers. Yes. So if if Pittsburgh is still in the running for a quarterback, which they most likely are, and the Browns, could there be a bidding war with the, within this within these two division rivals to go and get this guy? I I think it could be very possible, and I mean, it wouldn't it couldn't. Is there nothing more fitting than to put Deshaun Watson in Pittsburgh as Big Ben's heir apparent? And think about it that way. If if they're looking, if if Pittsburgh or if, even if the Browns aren't looking to get him, and they look over their shoulder and they see Pittsburgh's making a strong a strong play for Deshaun Watson, why would you not want to swoop in and say, "I'm not getting you. You go and take Jimmy Garoppolo." But you, this star player, he's ours. We've been lo- we've been building this roster for years. We haven't won a Super Bowl. You have six. Go f yourself. <laughs> I want Deshaun Watson, not you. Yeah, I mean, listen. I- trading for a quarterback out of spite definitely takes a lot of balls. I don't know if, uh, I don't know if that, I don't know if they're a team that's actually going to be willing to do something like that, but Hey, I, I I'm always up for, uh, always up for a little bit of a surprise there. Uh, I don't, uh, sorry, sorry, Brian. Go, go I don't ahead. even see that as spite because th- that's sort of more strategic looking at it and saying, if, if, you know, oh, well, I mean, you, you, you can make, you can make the case. Has, well, well, I mean, Adam, you can make the case that it's strategic, obviously, but, uh, you, you know, you, you can make the case that it is strategic, uh, but at the, at the same time though, there is the, uh, there is the idea that, you know, if you're going to do something like that, you know, quarterback is a big, posi- is a big position. It's right. when, when you're making an arms race for a guy, say you say there's a good linebacker on the market, you know, you, you can have an arms race for that guy and, and, and a division rival might pick him up to be like, Hey, we got this guy over you quarterback you only got one of those you only got one quarterback and that guy is commanding your offense he's the whole face of your operation to get a to get to have an arms race for a quarterback can be a very risky deal and it can backfire on you again you know who, who knows maybe deshaun watson meets 30 more masseuses and we have this whole issue again so again so how do you feel about baker mayfield going up against ben roethlisberger two times two times of a season you mean you mean watson if you if, the if, it, if it's if it's Watson, go, yeah, go, Ben. Ro- I yeah. said Ben Roethlisberger yeah, yeah, going yeah. up against Deshaun Watson, it, especially with that Steelers roster that they have. That team could, uh, assuming they improve on that improve on that offensive line, um, that team could really explode and become. You know, that could block uh, pit, uh, the Cleveland from being able to make any sort of impact with what they have. Yeah, I think that's very possible. I mean, I, I, I don't really, I don't really like Baker Mayfield's chances, but then again, who knows how Amari Cooper will factor in the, factor into that offense? I know, you know, what the last time he had a star receiver like, uh, like Odell Beckham Jr. in there, it didn't pan out too well. But then again, it, it, it anything could really turn around for him. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I, I, I it is going to be difficult though to see what Cleveland does with Amari's, Amari's contract because he's owed twenty million next year. That I mean, twenty million next year, and again through twenty twenty five, twenty million dollars over these next three years. That's a lot of money to be paying to this guy who, you know, obviously could be entering the prime of his career. And maybe, maybe, you know, with the way the cap goes up, that turns into a steal. But again, that's a lot of money that you're pouring into this guy. Is Baker Mayfield enough? Is Baker Mayfield the type of guy that can capitalize on that? that I don't know. Right. And that that's what that's also what I would be. This would be part of it is that this would be assuming that the, that Amari Cooper's deal is reworked. Yeah. That they go to they go to Amari Cooper and we say we want to make a we want to make a a run at Deshaun Watson. We believe we could surround you with a great team, something that uh something that the Cowboys were not able to do uh enough at least. They were they were competitive, but with this roster that they have if they're able to add uh Deshaun Watson to the mix, to that mix, then they're one of the better teams in the AFC yeah. automatically. Yeah, I mean I, I think that is a good push for the Browns to make. I don't know exactly what uh, Baker's appeal would be to get him out of Cleveland. I know that he's still under contract or at least going into his contract year. So I don't know where exactly they could put him on a deal. I don't know if you could, I don't know if there's a, I don't know if his contract could be worked out in a way to where you could outright release him onto the market. So there's also that part of it too, to where I don't know what you would do with Baker Mayfield to get him off the roster at this point. There, there, there's that, there's that aspect of it too. And I wonder what his trade market would be 
his value would be at that point. Yeah, exactly. Uh, the walk off podcast, though, did make a good point as to saying, you know, obviously, uh, you know, we're, we were talking about Deshaun Watson kind of being like the last star guy on the market. Uh, obviously, Kyler Murray, uh, who, you know, the walk off mentioned uh, is kind of in the middle of an ugly situation in Arizona, in Arizona, but he actually surprisingly has been able to repair things, uh, or at least it looks like there have been some uh, some whisperings of things getting repaired within the past couple of days. Uh, he's recently reposted all of the photos that he took off his Instagram onto there. So uh, I don't know what the situation is going to be there, so, but uh, you know, very interesting situation there as well. Yeah. If I were to make an educated guess on Kyler Murray, I know a lot of, a lot, you know, every, anytime any player expresses some frustration, all the fans always sort of overreact and they start doing Jersey swaps in their favorite <laughs> teams. And they're like, is this going to happen? Yeah. Is he out on the way on his way out? I felt like this was, that was going to be something that was going to be solved and sure. Could Kyler Murray end up on a different team? Sure. But that would be more so in 2028, like, you know, <laughs> further down the road, he'll, he'll, he'll sign a big deal with Arizona and, or, and he'll be there for a little while. Then he'll be, uh, he'll be upset. He'll be tired of the, <laughs> their BS and then they're, and then they're going to trade him further down the road, sort of a Russell Wilson type thing or just any other quarterback who's been on the team for a while. But he just got to Arizona. Yeah, absolutely. There's going to be something there's going to be some stuff going on there, Adam. I don't know if you could read that for me, but uh, as to what they as to what yep. I'd be so pissed as a as a Cardinals fan, if they let him. go. <laughs> yeah, they, they, I, I'm just saying he's been on that team for only like two, three years. So yeah. I think he's going to be there for a little while. I don't think you have anything to worry about for now. Yeah, no, I, 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 I... Yeah, I, I'd be pretty pissed if they let him go too. I mean, I, I, I think I'd be pretty pissed. Uh, but I, I, I think that he should. I think that you know, for Arizona, for Cliff Kingsbury's sake, I think that he's going to be sticking with that with that organization for at least a little bit longer. So I, I, I would like to think that that uh, there's going to be some security with him there. I think that they'll work something out because I mean, they don't want to have to deal with this and have this turn into a whole saga. That like, like I, I think that they can figure something out with him now. Whether Kyler Murray is the solution in Arizona. I'm not too I'm not really too high on that, but we're going to have to really kind of play that by ear and see. Uh, however, Adam, you know, while we were talking about Amari Cooper, the repercussions of that and Deshaun Watson, uh, there's there have been some other moves going on around the NFL as well. Obviously, something that went down it's fairly like one a day, too. Yeah, it's been crazy. Adam Schefter put something out. It's literally been one groundbreaking move, uh, literally a day. And, uh, you know, the the you know, the uh, next to most recent one that came out was that uh, the Chicago Bears are trading are trading linebacker Khalil Mack to the Los Angeles Chargers in exchange for a second round pick this year and a sixth round pick next year. So obviously Khalil Mack, one of the premier defenders in the NFL, uh, going to L.A. So, you know, it's not the L.A. Rams. They're not getting, you know, this. The, oh, God, yeah, if it was that it, the L.A. Rams aren't, aren't getting aren't getting uh, aren't, aren't adding anything more to the pile, but. The L.A. Chargers, obviously, uh, you know, big, uh, big moves there going on with Joey Bosa, uh, you know, behind the line there. Uh, so that, that's going to be a pretty interesting tandem. Uh, you know, things just unfortunately fell apart in Chicago. You know, that whole situation with Matt Nagy getting fired. Uh, I mean, I remember when I remember when the Bears got Khalil Mack and it looked like, wow, they're really building for something. They ended up winning the NFC North at one point, And, you know, then then a double doink happened. And uh, that was kind of the end of that. So uh, uh, unfortunately, uh, it seems that that reign of that reign of terror in Chicago has come to a uh, screeching halt uh, and not a screeching halt. It's, it was actually more of like kind of watching a car crash in slow motion. Uh, so now, now that that's over, Khalil Mack is going to be going to the L.A. Chargers. Uh, very big move for very big move for L.A. to get him for, again, only a second and a sixth. Like for, for a guy of Khalil's uh, talent, that's really nothing. So yeah, obviously, they bought low on him, which yeah. was a good move for them. Mm -hmm. Good business move. You yeah, know, so it's a great move for them. I am really excited to see what Khalil's going to end up doing out there. Uh, you know. I, I don't know. I, I, I mean, the, the Chargers are the Chargers are a, are a great team. I think that, you know, Justin Herbert's in a great position to excel. But at the same time, though, I, I you know, they're kind of they're in a very tough division. I mean, uh, you know, I, I, it's called the AFC. It's called the a AFC West, but it really should be called the AFC's best because of how uh, because of how of how stacked it is. Obviously, you got the Kansas City Chiefs who run that whole operation. And th then you got the L.A. Chargers. And then to top it all off, now you have the, the Denver Broncos who also have just uh, added fuel to the fire by going out and getting quarterback Russell Wilson from the Seattle Seahawks. It's become an arms race. It, it, is what yeah, it is. I mean, you, I mean, yeah, again, you want to talk about an arms race. That division is an arms race. That is a that is a divisional arms race. Now, I, I don't think that the Raiders or anything were in on were in on a guy like Russell Wilson. They ended up the Broncos just went out and just rolled the dice and they absolutely scored. So they ended up they ended up acquiring him for uh, tight end 
Noah Fant, quarterback Drew Locke, uh, uh, defensive lineman Shelby Harris, and two two first round draft picks, two second round picks, and a fifth. So obviously Denver got a whole lot for uh, Russell Wilson. I think they also got a fourth uh, for him as well, just kind of as a draft compensation. Uh, but you know, like I mean, you know, the AFC West man is turning into a absolute battle right now. It's insane. Yeah, and I think I think people overrate. Uh, Denver's return a little, or sorry, Denver, Denver's return. They got Russell Wilson, yeah. uh, Seattle's return because they, yeah, they got the number nine overall pick, but it's in a draft that people are kind of thinking, uh, this draft looks like it's going to suck. It's it, not it, the best. This isn't a very good draft. It looks really bad. I'm, I'm not going to lie. Like the quarterbacks in this draft are just really aren't that appealing. I know. I, I know I kind of talked to Kenny Pickett at one, at one point, but he, I mean, it, you know, you just heard about his hand size has the smallest hands of any guy entering the NFL. So. I, listen, I, I know Joe, I know Joe Burrow got, you know, had a very similar treatment, but you know, Kenny Pickett's also kind of like a mobile guy too. And I, I, I don't really know how that's going to work out in the NFL, but I really don't know. Like yeah, this, this doesn't really seem like it's going to be that like that impactful of a draft. And then even if you look at the positional players they got, what are they going to do with Noah Fant in the next few years? They're stri- if they're stripping this thing down to the bone, which it looks like they are. Yeah. What's the point of getting these two players who are basically <laughs> in the middle of their primes? Yeah. What's the point? Mm -hmm. And it's not like Noah Noah Fant was this incredible tight end. He's a good tight end. He's solid. He's been on my fantasy team a couple of years, (laughs) but he's not, he's not one of those players where I look at and I say, this guy's going to change my organization. And then another first round pick in next year's draft, that's going to be a good pick. But is that worth, is that worth um, trading Russell Wilson away? Mm -hmm. I would have pumped if they're, if you're, Seattle, you might want to think seriously about punting from this draft, maybe trading some of those positional players and sort of trying to build up better assets because I'm not, I don't love this package that Denver got. I mean, I don't, or that I, Seattle got. Yeah, well, that, you mean that Denver gave up. So obviously, I'm not really a big fan of it either. I, I again, uh, Drew Locke has really kind of fallen out of favor right. at me at this point. He, I, I, I really <laughs> I forgot I, to mention it. <laughs> yeah, I, again, yeah, well, it's because he's kind of that much of a non factor at this point. Listen, Drew Locke had, had a chance to prove himself. At this point, I really don't see the appeal with a guy like him. I, I don't either. I, I mean, I, I liked him when he first came yeah, out. I was like, I liked you him know, too. He seemed like he could have been solid, but he, he sucks. He, he had some nice put. He had, and he had some nice pieces around him when he first took over. He had some nice performances, and I'm thinking maybe this guy could do something. And in fantasy, I did draft him as my backup too. Yeah. Uh, but it was it was one of those deep sleeper picks. But he he sucks now. He's not that good. And um, for that to be, it was a throw in. He's obviously a placeholder for the, for them to throw in as a throw in as a starter for a little bit. And like I said, they're stripping this thing down to the bone. Yeah. So why, like, it feels like some of the, the pieces are the type of return you would want if you're trying to win in the near future. Yeah. It looks like Seattle's trying to win like maybe three, four years from now. (laughs) Yeah, I, I thought you were gonna say they're looking like they're trying to win three, four games, and I was like, bingo. But uh, that, that would be true too. <laughs> there is that. Right. But I mean, Adam, does Seattle have like the worst QB room in the league? I mean, let me read this thing off to you. The QB room it goes: Drew Lock, Geno Smith. Who I, I forgot that guy's still on the roster. How does he have a job still? I don't. I mean, listen, he started games last year, which is how. How are you starting games in the NFL, man? So it was Drew Lock, Geno Smith, and Jacob Eason. Like, how is that a quarterback room that's allowed in the NFL? That that shouldn't even be a CFL locker room. Like, on, honest to God, that, that that's that's atrocious. And that that further inf- reinforces my point that why are you getting these positional players if you're going to have a quarterback room like that? Yeah. What's Noah Fant going to do for you? Yeah. And you do have Tyler Lockett, who it looks like they could be trading him soon as well. And mm-hmm. GK Metcalf in a year or two might be saying, I want out of here. No, I mean, it could be sooner than a year or two with the way this thing's going. Well, yeah. It, it, like who, who this, knows if things get ugly this season, you could see DK Metcalf like, on the move. It's like, yeah, Denver gave up a lot, but it doesn't feel like the fit for what Seattle's trying to do right now. Yeah. I mean, the only thing, the only thing that could turn this thing around is if, you know, Seattle was to go and get a guy and get a guy like Deshaun Watson, if they, if they were to make a move on a guy like that and say, Hey, we're rolling the dice. We want to, we want to jumpstart this thing back up. That That's the only thing, thing that could make sense, but I, I don't really see the case where Seattle does something like that. Yeah. I I'm not it, sure. It, it, it looks like they're stripping you... this thing down to the bones. Cause not only did they get rid of Russell Wilson, they also released Bobby Wagner outright. Oh and, yeah. I forgot about yeah. that. And I mean, I, I didn't realize this when this, when, when it happened, but Bobby Wagner actually tweeted about the whole incident. And he basically ended up saying that I played in this organization for 10 years. 
I didn't find out from them that I was released. So, yeah, he didn't find out from Pete Carroll or uh, or their owner. What is it, Snyder? I, I couldn't tell Schneider. you. Uh, it beats me. Yeah, either way. What a what a clown show that's going up on that's going on in Seattle right now. I mean, all, all you had to do was run the ball at the one yard line. That's all you had to freaking do. <laughs> and you screw- that's really boiling things yeah. down. Yeah, it, it really be back to back champs. Yeah, it's ten now over but instead we're eight years later and uh I think they've just fallen off. I mean, you want to talk about people that have fallen off a cliff. Seattle's uh you know, they're they're kind of in the toilet right now. They've they've really fallen off uh off the wagon. It's terrible. And it sucks because they they have been they're one of the teams who have been who have remained competitive throughout the the entirety of the 2010s and even a little bit in the 2020s. And yeah. now here we are. It's sad to see how this team has fallen off because it's hard to see consistency. But then again, when it comes to being competitive in the NFL. But then again, Adam, I mean, they had about like an, an eight to 10 year run that you could have like really said le- that they were legitimately in it for. I mean. That's you what know. I'm saying. So, I mean, you know, but again, you know, Russell Wilson came into the league in like two, in like 2011, 2012. It's been so they had that dynasty from that from then up until now. It's been 10 years. It's, you know, that, you know, most NFL teams and franchises are lucky to be successful for that long. So, you know, for Seattle, it, it you're just this is just part of growing up. You're just seeing the end of the dynasty like this is them tearing it all down. And unlike New England, where they were able to bounce back and get a first round quarterback the next year and make some moves. I don't know when we're going to see Seattle back in the playoffs, yeah. being honest with you. But when, when, yeah, that's understandable. But when you have an NF, you, when you have a legit elite NFL quarterback, like Russell Wilson, yeah, and you had one of the better well-oiled machine defenses for most of that time. Mm-hmm. And you're not able to do anything besides one Super Bowl in the beginning, and you f- you fail to run the ball in, in the next one, and then you never even see the 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 conference championship game after that. Then that's a little bit of a problem to me that you weren't able to sort of capitalize on that. On top of a respectable coach, say what you will about Pete Carroll, respectable coach in in himself. I mean, I mean, the NFL is full of plenty of bad coaches that just Pete Carroll by default becomes one of the better ones. Yeah, it's. Like they have, they've, they've had pieces around. I know that, that since Marshawn Lynch, they weren't able to find that his replacement, but you know, they've, they've had, they've had pieces and they, they weren't able to capitalize on it. And Russell Wilson's in the peak of his, of his career. He's playing pretty well. Yeah. And you weren't, and it, they didn't, he didn't leave because they're they like, we're going through a rebuild. He left because he was upset with the organization. Yeah. Well, I mean, the organization obviously wasn't giving him what they needed at this point, and it just became apparent that this whole thing was uh, getting torn down. So I can't really blame Russell Wilson for wanting out of, for wanting out of Seattle. Obviously, he's, obviously he's going into Denver now. That's going to be a very interesting situation with him there. Uh, and again, the AFC, the AFC West is just completely loaded. I mean, the fact that Russell Wilson is going to be battling with Patrick Mahomes twice a year is going to be fun to see. That's Talk gonna... about the wild, wild West. <laughs> yeah, that's going to be some exciting stuff. To I mean, watch. I mean, that's one way of putting it. It is, really is the wild West out there. So uh, it's going to be very fun to see. I'm excited for what's going to come with those guys, uh, you know, down the line. But, uh, you know, another quarterback that uh, that, you know, just had his home. Uh, you know, decided within the past couple of days as well was Mr. Aaron, Aaron Rodgers. Instead of going out to Denver, though, which many people speculated that he was going to do, he is staying with the Green Bay Packers. Uh, he ended up agreeing to a deal which uh, is still kind of up in the air right now. There were some rumors that it was going to be a four year, uh, 200 million, or a, I think it was like four years, five, no, it was four years, $200 million a year. So uh, he was going to be getting paid $50 million. That deal is actually, uh, you know, since been come out to be false from what we've heard, even though people are still reporting on it is true. Uh, Pat McAfee, who originally was going to break the deal, has since said that that deal has since said it's nothing close to that. It's more likely uh, a team friendly one year deal. But at least for 2022, we're going to see Aaron Rodgers and, uh, you know, as well as Devontae Adams, who just got franchise tagged by the pack back in Green Bay for at least one last season. So, uh, you know, obviously we thought that last year was going to be the last dance. Obviously, that kind of got screwed over by the 49ers. But uh, what do you think? What, what do you think about Rodgers, you know, coming back for, you know, at least another year in Green Bay? So if it, if it is a one year deal, then you have to wonder if this was the this was the last dance post that Devontae Adams and Aaron Rodgers were referring to rather than 2022. It's 2023. Mm. Uh, if it's that four year deal or any anywhere, any anything with him staying. I've said it. I've been saying it all off season. If Aaron Rodgers knows what's best for him, he leaves. Yeah. 
he's, you know, if he, for, with him staying and getting all of this money, it's they they have to cut all of their pieces on this on this roster that's been able to go to, uh, that's been able to finish as one of the top seeds in each of the past uh, few years. I mean, twenty nineteen to go to the conference championship back to back years. Mm-hmm. Actually, was it three straight or was it back to uh, back? It was back to back. And then they were supposed to make it this past year, but the forty nine. Well, they should have done more than just make it. They they I I had, I had them picked to win the Super Bowl this year. I mean, I I had them picked as, as a team to go on and win it as and, they deserve to be. And, and, and I and I hate the Packers. Like we both hate the Packers because we have a Packers uh, fan that, who, as one of our friends, Mr. Pat Edwards. Uh, you know, I despise the Packers, and I even had them going on to win the Super Bowl. I was like, all right, too many things are just going for them this year, and they completely folded under the pressure. I mean, right. But that's my point. They're they're in cap hell now. Yes. And they're gonna have to take. They're gonna have to to trade some pieces away or release them. Uh, one name ha- that has been thrown around a lot, Zadarius Smith, who's yes. been one of the biggest pieces of that defense. That secondary looks great, and it's young. They'll, they won't have they won't have to have any issues there. Mm-hmm. Um, but past that, their front seven's going to stink. Yeah. Um, their their wide receiver room, besides Devontae Adams, still sucks. <laughs> so it's 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 been a good situation recently for Aaron Rodgers, but it's not going to, it's only going to get worse from there. They might be able to be competitive, but mm-hmm. they're not winning a super bowl. And, and at any point, no, I yeah. fear, I said it before I posted about it. I fear that if Aaron Rodgers stays in green Bay for too long, he's never going to win another ring. Uh, yeah, no, I, 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 at this point, I really have, I have similar fears and similar thoughts as well. I, I for me, I'm just like, Aaron Rodgers needs a change of scenery. I think at this point in his career, green Bay was great for what it did great things for him when he was there. But at this point in time, you, like you said, they're in cap hell. They're not in the position to put things around Aaron Rodgers, which is what they're going to need to do if they want to get him into a super bowl. And I, I think Stephen A. Smith said it best. Aaron Rodgers needs to win at least two super bowls with the Packers. And it, you know, it, and if this had been the four year contract, he said that over those next four years, he would have needed to win two Super Bowls to, you know, make to make this contract worth it. Otherwise, it was a complete waste. And it just, you know, uh, it was a mistake for him to come back to Green Bay. I can't help but agree with that sentiment. It's just Aaron Rodgers wasting his time now. Yeah. Because, you know, he's in a good he's I, I'm I mean, I he's going to I mean, he's going to be 38 years stay with the organization that drafted him. But you can't you're lying to yourself if you think that there's good blood between the two. No, there's absolutely staying not. and they just hate each other. It's like a divorce that they're not willing to make because they're thinking, what would what do the kid? What would <laughs> how are we going to take care of the kids? Take care of the kids being maybe the fans or the other players. Take care of the kids by just just leaving. Sometimes divorce is the right thing to do, kids. <laughs> oh Jesus Christ! But it's not turned turn into life lessons yeah, by Adam Wright. Jesus Christ! I mean, the, the down to the wire. This is usually a very uh, fun and laid back show. I didn't really expect that. Didn't expect this to get super serious here. But all right. Anyways, uh, you know, I, I I don't know what I. I I, I want Aaron Rodgers to do what's best for him. I don't think that this is it. I think that he should have tried to figure out another situation, but maybe by, by maybe he had a little bit of an intel that John Elway was going to pull the, uh, well, not John Elway anymore, but that Denver was rather going to pull the trigger on Russell Wilson and ended up saying, all right, that was pretty much my premier destination. I don't really have anywhere else to go at this point. I know Tennessee was thrown up in the air, but they're kind of locked into Ryan Tannehill for the next couple of years. And even if, even if they would have been totally up for getting rid of him, I don't know if their financial situation would have allowed for that. I actually, I, I'm not sure about that. Let me go. Let me go look that up on spot track because last I checked, they were actually up there in cap space. Yeah. Well, well, well I know the Titans were one of the teams that Rogers had uh, ex- ex- expressed interest in, but then again, who knows? Uh, you know, the whole situation with him though uh, is it's definitely going to be very interesting. I don't know what the deal is going to be, but yeah. Yeah, no, Tennessee, Tennessee was, but they, they made some moves and uh, I think it was the Harold Landry deal, but they're, they're actually below average in cap space. So never mind. Okay. Yeah. So yeah, they're they're not really in, they're not really in a good spot to make some moves either, but I don't know with with Aaron Rodgers, I want to see, I, I, I want to see him go out and win two, two more Super Bowls. If if, to make a deal, like something, some to make a deal worth it, he needs to win it. I mean, you at least need to see a Super Bowl in Green Bay next year. And I, I, every year, Aaron Rodgers comes out with a different slogan. With a different slogan, whether whether that be, "All right, guys, we all need to we all need to relax. We need to relax, everybody." Or hey, R E L A X. Yeah. Or 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 hey, we're gonna run the table. And yeah, guess what, man? You go on great runs after that. But at the end of the day, you need to go out there and win the big one again. It's been twelve years at this point. They made the conference championship both years that one of those said run the table R E L A X. Yeah. 
but they they lost those both of those conference championships in heartbreaking fashion. One of them was close, and you could you could you can argue that in 2014 the the Packers just coached were just poorly coached and they mismanaged, but you still your defense got you four turnovers, all picks by Russell Wilson, and they weren't able to get there. The and then the Falcons just flat out clocked. Yeah, that, that looked like that looked like the Bryant Wagner game. The, the Packers just got dogged in that one. It was they, bad. Yeah, they they killed them in there. But you, yeah, you still, man, it's it stinks. Yeah, it, it really does stink. I don't know what the situation with Rodgers is going to be moving forward. I mean, again, he's going to have to win one if he wants to make this deal worth it. Otherwise, uh, it 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 completely it, it's going to completely fall flat on his face. If this is a multi year deal deal though. You know, regardless of whether Rodgers is successful in Green Bay or not, uh, it's official now that Jordan Love is the worst draft pick of all time. I mean, it, it has to be because you drafted a guy with the idea of getting rid of your getting rid of Aaron Rodgers. And then at the end of the day, you were too afraid to pull the trigger. I mean, it, and it just shows it because, yeah, maybe Aaron Rodgers. Yeah. Did he go out and win, and, and win MVPs the next two years? Yep, he did that. But at the end of the day, you had you had your mind set out on getting rid of this guy. And the fact that you weren't willing to pull the trigger just shows that you completely fell flat in your face. Yeah, it, it was the right move at, at the time, but it was one of those things where you look at it and you say you could have gotten Jordan Love in the second round. You probably you probably could you could have. If you had gotten him in the second round, you wouldn't have had nearly as many discussions as you did. The fact that you spent a, a first round premium draft pick on a guy like Jordan Love is the most egregious part. There, you could have gotten a wide receiver at that at that position. You could have done something offensively. But I, I, I remember when they drafted Jordan Love, it, it made news because he was the first offensive player drafted by the Packers since Aaron Rodgers. And yep. Yeah, I, you 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 never know with with him whether or not he would have whether or not love would have fallen into this into the second round. Um, I think he would. I mean, the Packers it's, it's the, the, the Packers selected thirty first. Of course, he was going to fall in the second round. I don't think the Chiefs were taking him. <laughs> Chiefs Chiefs draft draft uh, Mahomes is backup. Yeah, yeah, like, yeah, like, you one, know, like one year after winning the Super Bowl. Like I think, well, the Packers were either like thirtieth, thirty first, or something. Yeah, like that. because like, they, well, they didn't go to the Super. They Bowl. were in the conference so championship they were, game, so they were they were no, they got him at the 29th pick. 29th pick. Yeah. So it they they felt they felt that they wanted to go and get their next guy and tra- transition to the next quarterback, and yet it turns out he sucked. Yeah, if, if <laughs> he you did could, suck. Let's th- let's think about it if this way: if he if he was able to play then we'd have a different situation. Yeah, you'd have hands. a really different and situation, but you saw him play against Kansas City. He sucks. He's terrible. I agree. I agree. He's he trash. Sucks. I'm not I mean, trying to argue that. No, I mean, I mean, he his his interception to, to a touchdown ratio at, at Penn State or wherever he was playing back then, uh, it was absolutely, no, it was Utah. Uh, wait, where did, where did, where did freaking uh, Jordan Love play? I'm stupid. Yeah, I think he played at Utah, right? Jordan Love? Yeah, he played at, uh, yeah, yeah. I, I think Utah. Yeah. You look, look it up. Though, yeah, I'm, just to I'm, make sure. I'm so stupid right talking. now. Yeah. You know, let me look this up. Jordan Love. Jordan coach. Love. He, I mean, it, it, like I said, I, yeah, I think you, it you, was, Utah State. I knew it. I, I knew it. But I, I, the for, concept I, of the move was the was the right move at the time. He, you have a, you have an old quarterback who you at that at that age you take it year by year, mm-hmm. and on a team that is still still competent, you want to draft their their replacement around that time. And now we we're, we're I think we're spoiled by seeing Tom Brady and some other quarterback like Drew Brees mm-hmm. going into their 40s. But that's actually rare. That's actually oh, it's, incredibly, it's incredibly rare. rare. It's that, incredibly the only time rare. that's ever happened besides those two quarterbacks is Brett Favre. Yeah. And, and he was and, and Warren was, and Warren Moon <laughs> and Warren Moon. Yeah. But in that and even and, in that year, Brett Favre, you can you can you could you can argue that was more so the roster around him because the year before that with uh with the jets he was horrible oh yeah he was awful with them so maybe it was just the armored roster around him that helped him but yeah. tom brady drew Brees, those two are just superhuman no exactly so obviously they're superhuman uh it's gonna we're gonna really have to see uh can rogers more athletic play style uh translate into his late 30s and possibly early 40s that's going to be something that we're going to have to determine as uh, as we go along. I have my doubts. And, you know, even if it does, I don't think that Green Bay is going to be the place for him. But, uh, you know, as we move on, there was one final quarterback move that uh, did catch our attention. Obviously, doesn't have as much, doesn't doesn't nearly have the gravitas of uh, of an Aaron Rodgers or, you know, Russell Wilson trade. Uh, not even nearly as much as Amari Cooper or Khalil Mack. But uh, 
Carson Wentz, everybody, uh, give it up for him. He's going to be the next quarterback of the Washington Commanders. Still hate that name. That name fucking sucks. I mean, that, that name is atrocious. Carson Wentz. Yeah. Oh, the Commanders. You yeah. Know. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so that was, you know, I was just dissing Carson Wentz. Um, yeah. I mean, I mean, I'll just, I mean, I'll just Carson Wentz because I, because I, I mean, ever since, I, I mean, I don't I, hate the name. I don't hate his name. Oh, I just hate the Commanders name. Oh, the command. Yeah, the commanders. Yeah, uh, that, that's the that name. Was I was, terrible that's name. the name I was talking about. That, that name is terrible. Honestly, better, than, better than the football team. <laughs> I mean, I guess. But I mean, like, it, I mean, it, it's not too much of a step up. I think the president presidents would have been a good name. Yeah, it it, it would have been all right. Ma- match the, you know, the the area that you're in. And it could um, could have worked. But re- who knows? Regarding that, it these are this is a team that was that was making a lot of who is very clearly very desperate at yes. quarterback. They, you, you heard, you heard them come out and that they tried to go and get Deshaun Watson. Most recently, Russell Wilson, then will, then Wilson goes over and he goes to the, uh, and he gets traded to the Broncos. Yes. And the next day they, they, it looks like they settled and they went and they, they traded for Carson Wentz. Yeah. And it looks like I, I commented this on your, uh, on your Instagram page. I said, this is, this is one of those things where you're settling on another, another girl who's who you're not as interested in because your crush rejected you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, listen, I, I, I'm not one to make comparisons for that, but I, when I when I hear the when I hear the whole Carson Wentz deal going down, and if you had heard some of the buzz going beforehand, there were rumors that the Washington Commanders called every single NFL franchise asking about a quarterback trade, every single one. So in 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 that logic, they called the Kansas City Chiefs asking about Patrick Mahomes. The they called the Baltimore Ravens asking about Lamar Jackson. They called the Buffalo Bills asking about Josh Allen. But at the end of the day, they got Carson Wentz who is made of paper and glass and can't stay on the field. I mean, listen, do I think that he was able to, you know, be somewhat decent last year? Sure. But at the end of the day, he had a healthy season. Yeah, though. yeah, I'll, and yeah. I'll give it to him because he had so he had some tough injuries to battle back. Yeah, with. exactly. So, I mean, listen, he had a healthy season this last year, but at the end of the day, week 17 or week 18 now, screw it because of the extra game. You come down to the uh, Jacksonville Jaguars and what happens? You, 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 get, you absolutely just get upset. So I don't know. Yeah, it's they'll be all right because Carson Wentz is that type of player where he can make your team okay and they have some pieces around you, but I would have waited on Deshaun Watson. Yeah, I mean, I mean, all you had to do was wait a couple extra days and Deshaun would have been freed. So, I, I mean, and again, I, I think you, I think you can get, I think you could probably get Deshaun for really not that much because I think that his trade value because of all the controversies surrounding him is going to be down. So, I think that, you know, had you, had you waited, you could have gotten a much more talented option. But at the end of the day, this just seems so fitting for a Washington quarterback. I mean, Washington's never used to really having too many talented guys, but uh, you know, it's, it, it's kind of, it, it's kind of tough. It's uh, I don't know what the situation's going to be there. Obviously uh, you know, kind of a very interesting situation there, but you know, uh, I, I'm, I'm very excited to see what's going to happen. This, this NFL off season, there's going to be some crazy moves happening within the next couple of days, Adam and free agency hasn't even started. Yeah, yet. no, I mean, just the trades alone, Adam have been absolutely insane. Uh, you know, I'm going to be really excited to cover all of that when that does go down. But unfortunately, Adam, I hate to say it, but we are now down to the wire. Yes, sir. We are now down to the wire, which means that we're going to wrap up everything we talked about in this episode and then to get on our way and send you guys into this weekend. Obviously, we are recording this on Saturday rather than Friday. But we started things off on this episode by welcoming it, Adam, of the Fumble Rooski podcast to come in and, and talk about things on the show. Jesus, Adam, you're just going to leave me hanging for a second time in a row. My God. So uh, what is this? Yeah. Yeah. There you go. Just a quick little firm handshake. Yeah. How are you doing? Fucking prick. But uh, (laughs) yeah. So uh, obviously we started things off by revisiting the Bryant University basketball team playing, uh, playing against the Wagner Seahawks and, uh, you know, absolutely just bullying them on and off the court. Uh, One thing I I wanted to revisit the fact that uh, Wagner College made a response in which they said, we want to read it again. No Wagner student was directly involved in the incident, but we decided to remove ourselves from the increasingly hostile and unmanageable situation. Yes, again, by way of the Rhode Island Police Department. So I'm glad you were able to have yourselves removed. That's the way it should have been phrased. But at the end of the day, uh, you know, one one team's going to the NCAA tournament. One team is going to be sitting at home in Staten Island, which at the end of the day, you know, even if Wagner won, they're the real losers because they have to they have to they're, they have to play in freaking Staten Island and they have to live there. Too. Yeah, I mean, I've been to Staten Island. Jesus Christ. So, uh, you know, you know, even if we had been on the losing side, 
we would have been the real winners because we are because we're from Rhode Island. So uh, good for us. Uh, after that, we ended up talking about the MLB uh, ending their lockout after a you know 99 day stalemate. Uh, we're going to have a full 162 game season. We also talked about all the, uh, you know, new rule changes that will be coming on the way to the MLB this next season. Uh, in NFL news, we talked about uh, the Cowboys uh, sending Amari Cooper to the Cleveland Browns, as well as Khalil Mack to the L.A. Chargers. We then also got the chance to revisit Russell Wilson to the Denver Broncos and Aaron Rodgers going back to the Green Bay Packers and finish things up by talking about the lowly Carson Wentz going to the even lowlier Washington Commanders. Obviously, a ton of moves happening in the NFL. Uh, the reason I didn't cover the Wilson and Rodgers trades was because I, again, spent an entire episode talking about the Bryant University basketball game. So, uh, you know, I'm really happy about the way this thing went. Uh, you know, really, really great to have Adam on the show. If you're not following Down the Wire at this point, you can follow us at down.tothewire on Instagram for any updates regarding the show. You can also find us on any streaming platforms, whether that be Spotify, Google Podcasts, Apple Podcasts, and more. Adam, you want to sign? You want to say anything before we sign off? Oh well, go check out my podcast, the Fumble Rooski Podcast. We have uh, we're expanding. We have a, a bigger team. We already have. We've had Justin Tucker. Our, our favorite Ravens fan for the entirety <laughs> of our show. He's a co-founder. We added CJ Medeiros, who's been great. Justin Hill, Ju uh, Justin Hill. We added Nick Carlson. We have a bigger crew to possibly expand to going two days a week. Uh, we get, our social media page covers, uh, is, gives daily coverage of the NFL. Uh, we're available on all, on all platforms. You name it, we got it. Uh, check out our YouTube channel. Uh, make sure you check us out because we give all of the best NFL coverage. We're the only NFL podcast you'll need. Absolutely. Well, Adam, again, thank you so much for coming on the show. I really do appreciate it. And from down to the wire, I'm Brian Costa. I'm Adam Wright. And we, will, we hope you guys have a great weekend. Take care and peace out.